People who decide to murder children are the worst types of human beings. Everyone is equally appalled and disgusted when hearing about yet another mass murder at a school. While we all agree these heinous acts should stop immediately, we don't all agree on how they should be stopped. So in this video, I'm going to lay out three steps to ending school shootings for good. A lot of research, conversations, time, effort, and energy took place in order to come to these conclusions. I didn't haphazardly create solutions out of thin air. This topic is serious, and I've done my best to stay as objective and factual as possible. These three steps are going to be in a certain order. That order is relative to time. Step one, being short term. Step two, being short to midterm. And step three, being long term solutions. So let's get started. Historically, security isn't anything new. In ancient Egypt, there were doorkeepers monitoring those who entered and exited a facility. The vigils urbani in ancient Rome were created under Caesar Augustus. They were tasked with police work, firefighter work, and securing Rome's perimeter. When you have something or someone of value, the common practice since the beginning of time has been to secure and protect. This leads me to step number one. Schools need to be hardened. Now let me unpack that because all of this is multifaceted. A facility becomes harder to penetrate by adding layers of security. A locked safe may have a biometric scanner, a keypad, or a dial that you turn in order to open it. The safe will also be made of hard material. This isn't to say that it's impossible to crack the safe, but these extra layers of security lengthen the time it takes to get to the valuables inside and also act as a deterrent for those who don't want to do all that work. This thought process has already been applied to banks, federal buildings, museums, local businesses, and even your house. How much more should that be applied to the buildings where our children go to learn? The hardening of our schools needs to be done by adding layers of security, and here's how it should be done. There needs to be a gate. Gates are some of the easiest deterrents when it comes to keeping people who shouldn't be on a property off that property. The only time the gates need to be left open is in the morning when kids are being dropped off and in the afternoon when kids are being picked up. Any time in between, the gate needs to be closed unless a school authority figure gives permission to open it. After someone gets through the gate, the person should approach locked exterior doors. These doors should lock every time they close. The only time they open is if school staff or students are entering and exiting the building. After entering the doors, a person should be met by an armed security officer. The amount of officers on location will depend on the size of the school, but there should be a minimum of two officers per school. Whether it's police officers or third party security will be left up to the individual states and their respective jurisdictions. However, police make on average $39,000 a year on the low end. So this can also be used as a way to provide additional income to cops. After greeting the armed security officer, everyone should have to pass through metal detectors. Now, there's this notion that metal detectors will make a school feel like a prison. Metal detectors don't feel like prison. Prison feels like prison. We all pass through metal detectors every day, whether it's at a local post office, a high-end finance firm, an NFL game, or a Taylor Swift concert, and nobody walks through a metal detector saying, man, I was excited to see Tom Brady, but now I feel like I'm in prison. Nobody. In addition to that, there is no reality where we as people should hold aesthetics above the safety of our children. 
Apple, Microsoft, Elon Musk, or even a no-name entrepreneur is more than capable of creating aesthetically pleasing metal detectors that don't look like they were built in 1980. Take this example of a Levi's store here in Nashville, Tennessee. The metal detectors were so well placed, I didn't even notice them until I was leaving the store. The classroom doors are next on the list. These doors should automatically lock as well, and they should also need key card access to open the door. This technology is common. So common that a company can opt to use physical cards or use their phone as the key card instead. Only staff and security should have access to these cards and there should be an override function that automatically locks all doors by disabling the keypads on the doors, just in case a bad guy makes it inside. The windows on the first floor need to be bullet resistant. These windows look completely normal to your standard window and provide the same functionality, they're just thicker. And lastly, teachers and staff need to be incentivized to get medical training and or firearms training. The average starting salary for a teacher in the United States is $41,000. Should a school employee decide they want to get training, they should be compensated in addition to their standing salary because they now provide more value to the school and the rest of the staff by having additional certification. I find it interesting that a lot of people who claim to be against arming teachers are the same people who brag about how much they do for their students and how they view their students as their own kids. Why be willing to buy kids lunch? pay out of pocket for class materials, and get invested in a child's life, but draw the line at protecting the child in your classroom. Some might say it's not their responsibility. I'd say even if it isn't, don't you still want to defend your own life? I have a buddy named Taylor, and I was in the car with Taylor some years back, and his girlfriend was also in the car, and Taylor was driving pretty fast. His girlfriend in the car said, oh my gosh, don't kill us. And he slowed the car down. I'll never forget this. He slowed the car down and he said, kill us? I ain't killing me. I'm definitely not going to do anything to harm you because I'm not going to do anything to harm me either. We're both going to live. And I thought that was interesting. You know, if somebody were to come into a classroom focused on killing everybody in there, if you really thought that you don't want to protect the kids in your classroom, if you protect yourself by default, you're protecting everybody else. So don't you want to save you? Just a thought. Now that we've discussed how to harden our schools, let's address how we can pay to harden our schools. We as a country find money for everything else we want to do bailing out banks, giving money to Ukraine, locking people up. But every time someone brings up spending money to protect our children, the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, it's not in the budget. What do you mean it's not in the budget? Buying the new platinum trim Toyota Tundra when your income is only $4,000 a month isn't in the budget. We're talking about our children, not political interests, not terrorism, our children. How schools are funded is complex, so in the interest of time, here's the 10,000 foot view. Schools in the United States receive funding from three sources, local, state, and federal dollars. In the 2019 to 2020 school year, the most recent data available, spending for public K through 12 education totaled $771 billion from all sources reflecting an increase for the eighth consecutive year. 771 billion with a B. It sure would be nice if someone put that money towards keeping our kids safe. Oh wait, Florida already has. Welcome back. The Osceola County Sheriff says the school guardian program is working in charter schools. Fox 35's Valerie Boy explains the benefits. 
Well, a new Guardian program is helping to relieve the shortage of deputies here in Osceola County, and it's also getting rave reviews at this charter school. A threat assessment briefing was scheduled for the next morning prior to the start of school. Christopher Boick receives an award for defusing a potential threat at this charter school. Thank you, sir. He's one of 25 safe school officers hired through the new school guardian program. I love working here. I love being around the kids. Sheriff Marcos Lopez says hiring guardians for charter schools is a way to make sure there are more deputies in the field. We decided to put him in on patrol and we hired a, a company and we trained the guardians and started putting them only in charter schools. He says the guardians are highly trained retired law enforcement, military or SWAT. The biggest difference between guardians and SROs is the cost. An SRO, we, the salary, the benefits, you know, it comes up to about 150000 a year. And with the Guardian, you consolidate that package and you let a third party manage it. He says that turns out to be around $50,000 for each hire. The principal at Slam Charter School says they had a school resource officer but now have a Guardian. As bittersweet as the change was, we have grown to see the positivity in the change. It's a very positive impact that I'm having on youth. So. And Sheriff Lopez says he's still looking for about a half a dozen deputies. In Osceola County, Valerie Boy, Fox 35 News. I'm going to read from the Florida Department of Education website to provide a little more context. Quote, Guardians are armed personnel who aid in the prevention or abatement of active assailant incidents on school premises. They are either school employees who volunteer to serve in addition to official job duties or personnel hired for the specific purpose of serving as a school guardian. Guardians must pass psychological and drug screenings and successfully complete a minimum of 144 hours of training. The 2019 legislator expanded the guardian program to include class D and G licensed security guards as well as certain school district or charter school employees who volunteered to participate in the program. State funds are granted to participating sheriff's offices to cover the screening and training costs for each guardian. Also, guardians receive a one-time stipend of $500 for serving in the program. For schools in need of guardians, but located in districts that do not have a guardian program, those schools may arrange for training with another sheriff's office that has established a guardian program." End quote. Every state is different. For instance, Wisconsin's solution may be slightly different than Florida's. However, a lot can be learned from the success that's already taken place with the guardian program. Is it working? Absolutely. Does it work? Yes. How do you feel the school guardian program is working in our state? How many mass casualty active assailant events have we had on a school in Florida since Stoneman Douglas? None. Pinellas County Sheriff Bob Gualtieri, Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd, and Hillsborough County School Police Chief John Newman are big supporters of the Coach Aaron Feist School Guardian Program. Named after one of the victims from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting in 2018, the program gives Florida school districts the option to hire less costly armed guards instead of law enforcement for their schools. School staff members, including teachers, included. We need more of them. For Gualtieri, who also leads the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Commission, school guardians are a no-brainer. If we don't have that armed person with a gun on these campuses, then we're being irresponsible and we're not being honest and we're leaving a campus vulnerable. Why would we do that? Today, guardians are being used in more than half of Florida school districts. Hillsborough County has 385 stationed at elementary and charter schools. The genius in the guardian program is whether you're a real small county or an extra large county like Hillsborough County, you can take the definition and apply it to your resources, to your finances, and really implement something that works for your district. Hardening our schools is of the utmost importance, and I'll tell you why. Because mass killers have explicitly talked about their desire to attack places where civilians can't defend themselves. The guy who shot up the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, initially considered attacking an airport, but decided against it because of substantial security. 
the 2015 church shooter in Charleston, South Carolina, was initially going to shoot up a college, but changed his plans after finding out the college had armed guards. And the Nashville shooter, who shot up the Christian school this year, picked that school because, amongst other reasons, it didn't have any security. The objective truth is that from the year 1950 to 2022, 96 percent of mass public shootings have taken place in gun-free zones. These psychopaths invest a lot of time and energy into planning which target to hit, so much so that they plan a year or two years in advance. Even David Hemingway, a gun control advocate and public health researcher at Harvard, said, and I quote, I suspect that most places that mass public shootings could logically occur are gun-free zones, either determined by the government or by private businesses and institutions." End quote. We must harden our schools and we must do it immediately. For part two, let's talk about the midterm solution. The second issue we need to fix is how the media handles mass shootings. Mass murderers have made it clear that they want to attack places where people can't defend themselves. In a 2016 wiretap of an ISIS supporter who won't be named, he said he was planning an attack on one of the biggest churches in Detroit. He stated, quote, a lot of people go there. Plus, people are not allowed to carry guns in church. Plus, it would make the news. Everybody would have heard." End quote. Jennifer B. Johnston, PhD of Western New Mexico University said, quote, mass shootings are on the rise and so is media coverage of them. At this point, can we determine which came first? Is the relationship merely unidirectional, meaning more shootings leading to more coverage? Or is it possible that more coverage leads to more shootings, end quote. There's a YouTube video by Spencer Snyder called How the Media Perpetuates Mass Shootings. He provides a compelling argument as to how the mainstream media plays a significant role in all of this. Here's a short clip from his video. Greg, as we know, with a lot of these shootings that we've unfortunately had to cover, there's a lot that is still going to be made clear later on in, in days and weeks ahead. Yeah, and I don't, I don't necessarily need the information, to be honest with you. I mean, there is math to this. When a mass shooting occurs, there's an increased probability of another one within 13 days because of something called generalized imitation. That's when a person's behavior is amplified and influences other people's behavior to engage in similar actions. We know this happens with mass shootings. The World Health Organization has issued guidelines for suicide on reporting suicide to reduce the, the, in, the incidence of copycats or imitational suicide. I really wish, you know, we sit here, we do this all the time. Oh boy, how, why does this keep happening? Why does this keep happening? Look in the mirror. You know, we, we constantly, prominently place these stories. We repeat facts over and over again. The frequency plays a role. We provide step-by-step -step descriptions of the crime. We do not limit the use of photos or videos. We have live press events. What I'm talking about is we increase the spectacle of an event so that it stays in somebody's mind. The more you increase the fre frequency of a report, the more likely somebody's gonna hear it and be influenced by it. All I'm saying is treat this, change the reporting methods, finally. The media treats self-deletion topics with kid gloves. YouTube itself frowns upon people using the S word, and there's an abundance of guidelines to follow when reporting on self-deletion to prevent self-deletion copycats. I'll link Spencer's video below for those of you who'd like to view it. I think it's interesting. So what's the solution? I can tell you right now, more government regulation over the media definitely isn't viable, but I have a couple resolutions. My first resolution is an agreement with University of Alabama criminologist, Adam Langford, where he said this. Well, I guess it just de depends on how dramatic the, the change or the intervention is, right? So um, if major media organizations change their processes in subtle ways and don't tell anyone about it, 
then I don't expect mass shooters to to change what they're doing at all, right? The best thing would be if you know major media companies came out and said, we're no longer going to publish the names or, or faces of mass shooters. And then the next time a mass shooting happens, which it will, they stuck to that, right? That would send a powerful message. And, um, and the mass shooters, I think, would start to learn that they can't be rewarded in the way they were in the past. My second resolution falls on the responsibility of the people. Next time you hear about a tragic shooting, don't post it everywhere and give media outlets endless views on their coverage. If you really want to talk about it, talk about the victims and their families and the heroes who stopped the murderer. Both of these solutions, and even more you may come up with, will all aid in stopping these psychos from pursuing fame by way of murder. Before I conclude with my third and final part, I'd like to insert an honorable mention. That honorable mention is mental health. Senator Richard Blumenthal said in the May 25th, 2014 edition of Face the Nation, quote, I am going to urge that we bring back those bills. Maybe reconfigure them to center on mental health, which is a point where we can agree that we need more resources to make the country healthier and to make sure that these kinds of horrific, insane, mad occurrences are stopped and the Congress will be complicit if we fail to act." End quote. In a New York Times article, studies showed that 43% of mass public shooters were seeing mental health care professionals prior to their shootings. It's very difficult for psychiatric professionals to know who will actually commit mass murder. Part of the reason being psychiatrists frequently underestimate threats to safety. They can also find it hard to accept that their own patients could actually pose a serious violent threat. Dr. Renee Binder, president of the American Psychiatric Association and big time gun control advocate said, quote, people with mental illness are far more likely to be victims of violence. The majority of individuals with mental illness will never be violent toward others. The risk of self-harm is far greater. So, if someone is actually a danger to others, the most effective solution is to send him or her to a secure mental health facility. There isn't a microwave solution to solving mental illness overnight. At some point, mental illness needs to be dealt with in this country. Going after law-abiding citizens who are mentally stable and healthy isn't the answer. I've labeled the third solution as a long-term solution because this is going to be the hardest thing to change for everyone watching. The common attitude in our society today is someone needs to do something. What that inherently means is someone else, please come fix my problems. Everything I spoke about up to this point will aid in ending school shootings. However, to truly put the nail in the coffin on this topic, one will need to look inward instead of outward. We live in a physical realm where everything is governed by a sense of order. Don't believe me? The earth revolves around the sun in an oval pattern. If earth gets too close to the sun, we all die. If earth gets too far away from the sun, we all die. By God's grace, it stays within what's called the Goldilocks zone, providing an ideal climate for human beings to live comfortably. Joining the earth in this revolution around the sun are all the other planets in our solar system. Not only does everything orbit the sun in harmony, but the solar system itself orbits the center of our Milky Way galaxy, flying through space at 515,000 miles an hour. The Earth recycles itself. We have gravity. What goes up must come down. We have day and we have night. We have seasons. There is a time to reap and a time to sow. Animals establish order through hierarchical structures. 
the human eye is composed of more than two million working parts. Human beings can't have too much of anything. We can't have too much sugar. We can't sit idle for too long without exercise or our bones will become weaker. There must be balance. There must be order. So if everything around us and within us functions to a perfectly tuned sense of order, how can we honestly think that we can live lives filled with disorder, yet have order as a result? To have order within a society, there must be responsibility. And responsibility is one of the biggest things people run from. No matter how you slice this, responsibility cannot be overlooked. We can have the hardest schools, man. Great media, etc. But in addition to these things, we must take responsibility for how we live our lives and how we raise our children. I believe there's a direct correlation to the degradation of our United States and the increase in mass shootings. The school system, television, and social media are now raising our children. Families don't even gather at the table to speak to each other on a consistent basis anymore. There's no sense of honor, pride, and family values. There's only what's politically correct and what's acceptable for right now at this moment. It will change tomorrow, and when it changes, no one will stand against it because there's no objective truth anymore. Everything is your truth, my truth, his and her truth, not the truth. Where is God in our society? We've become so smart that now we don't think we need him. Why? Because we have iPads and BMWs, material things that are constantly breaking down. If you look at the statistics of gun ownership in the United States from the 1970s to today, you'd notice that it's almost identical. Nothing has changed when it comes to guns, yet everything has changed when it comes to how we live, what we accept, and how we interact with one another. Think about how strong the family unit was in the 1970s compared to today, and how our personal responsibility, honor, and pride has decreased over the years. I'm optimistic about our future as a nation. When you really break down gun violence, 65% of all gun-related deaths every year are attributed to self-deletion. An additional 30% are attributed to gang violence. That's already 95%. And the remaining percentage is a mixture of self-defense shootings, accidental shootings, and police shootings, which get lumped in as well. There's no separate category for police shootings. School shootings and mass shootings, although scary, account for less than 1% of gun-related deaths. And when you break the data down into bite-sized chunks, suddenly the solutions become more doable. Will it be easy? Of course not. We didn't get here overnight, and it won't be fixed overnight. But it'll never get fixed if we choose to do nothing or leave it in the hands of our elected officials. Our country has faced greater challenges than this. So I'm confident if we as a nation can bypass the political rhetoric and focus on the root of the issue by following the solutions presented today, we will end school shootings for good. I'm Jared Roman with Austin Trainings. Thanks for watching.